Hi folks, this is Ken Behrens with Tropical Birding, and today I'll take you on a virtual birding tour of Ethiopia. It's one of my favorite places on Earth. When I first moved to Africa to work for Tropical Birding, I spent months in Ethiopia right off the bat. Absolutely loved it. Ended up writing a uh, site guide about where to find the country's birds. Uh, here's some geographical context. It's this big mountain dome that's split by the Great Rift Valley. So it's essentially this montane island surrounded by lower-lying, drier country. So you can see this is savanna and desert, and then the green and yellow is montane habitats. Here's the Great Rift Valley. If you know much about biogeography, you know that this kind of setup makes for endemics. Indeed, there's a whole bunch of bird endemics, like the Abyssinian siskin, and there's endemic mammals too, like the mountain yala. It's also great for migrant birds, palearctic birds, like uh, woodchat shrike. And all of these things are just incredibly tame. This picture shows uh, someone I was guiding walk right up to this pole that had a step eagle perched on top, and the bird just wouldn't fly away. When we left, it was still there. Um, this is a bird that maybe in Central Asia would fly away if it saw a human within a mile of it. In Ethiopia, it just sits there. It's incredible. It has some of the world's tamest wildlife, so it's paradise for a photographer. People imagine Ethiopia as this desert, flat and dusty and flies and famine, and that's just completely wrong. It's this lush, green, highland country. It does have those low-lying areas around it, but most of this tour is spent in the highlands, which really don't conform to people's stereotypes whatsoever. Ethiopia is also incredibly rich in culture. It's just unlike any other place in the world. These were photos from an Ethiopian Orthodox church. This is an ancient Bible that's hundreds of years old, just sitting there. These are people harvesting grain by hand up in the highlands. Threshing. Ethiopia has a bit of a Middle Eastern feel to it. It feels like a place lived in by humans for a very long time. But unlike the Middle East, it still has tons of birds and other wildlife. And another great thing about Ethiopia, it has wonderful coffee. And this shows a coffee ceremony, which is basically how to spend two hours drinking a cup of coffee, how to kill a hot mid-afternoon. You offer snacks, and you roast the coffee over the fire, and then you brew it, you boil the water and brew it, and it's wonderful coffee. This shows the map of the tropical birding tour. You do sort of a figure eight. You start in the capital, you go up into the northern mountains, you drop into the Rift Valley, you go down through the Rift Valley, southern mountains, into the southern lowlands, and then back up through the Rift Valley. This is the capital of Addis Ababa. Uh, it's a big city and it's growing very, very fast. It's quite a dynamic, bustling place. It's also a pretty good city for birding. You're up at about 7,500 feet and there's montane forest and woodland. And so we usually start our birding right in the garden of our hotel. It's one of the nice common species, Takazi sunbird. We also start to see endemics. Uh, this is a thick-billed raven. And among all the passerines, passerines are about half of the world's birds. This one has the biggest bill. <laughs> That's its claim to fame. After everybody's arrived in Addis, we drive up over this pass and then we drive onto the Saluta Plain and keep looking for some more endemic birds. That's what it looks like on Saluta Plain. It's uh, heavily cultivated, but typical of Ethiopia, there's still lots and lots of birds. Like the Abyssinian Longclaw, it's an endemic. And the funky wattle ibis has this weird wattle hanging off its chin, also endemic. There's some little wetland areas up there where we normally see the blue-winged goose, also endemic. This is a strange goose. Its closest relatives are the South American geese, 
So it uh, seems to be a very ancient thing that's been in Ethiopia for a long time. So we cross the Surulta Plain and we end up on the edge of this huge valley and we visit two places. One is called Debre Libanos. Spectacular view down into the valley. This is one of the most sacred sites in all of Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. And as we drive in, we often see pilgrims approaching on foot. These folks have come from all over Ethiopia. Sometimes they walked for weeks or months to get there. There's the monastery, and it's surrounded by a little relic patch of forest that has uh, been preserved because this is a sacred place. And there's some more endemic birds like the white-cheeked turaco. It's always a crowd pleaser. Abyssinian woodpecker, that's one of the more scarce endemics. We drive a little ways to the west to a place that's called the Portuguese Bridge. I'm not quite sure why it's called the Portuguese Bridge. It definitely wasn't built by Portuguese, but uh, it's quite a scenically spectacular place. It's a view down into the valley. It's a great place for raptors. Egyptian vulture, still pretty common in Ethiopia. And on the way, I usually buy some bones and I put them out on the hillside below. And sometimes this works to attract a lammergeier. These guys are famous as bone crackers. They'll pick up a big chunk of bone, they'll fly away in the air, they'll drop it, they'll smash it open, and then they can eat the marrow inside. Huge birds. So we sleep in this area, and then we wake up very, very early while it's still very dark, and we make this drive, and we drop down into the Jemu Valley. Now, I really like biogeography, so I hope this isn't boring for folks, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the geography and biogeography of the Jemu Valley. It's tied in with the Nile River, so that's the world's longest river. You see the White Nile starts down here on Lake Victoria, and the Blue Nile on Lake Tana, in the northern mountains of Ethiopia. And if you look at the satellite imagery, here's Lake Tana, and the Blue Nile makes a big loop like this, and then crosses the border of Sudan. Here's the Jemu Valley and the Jemu River, so that's one of the big tributaries of the Blue Nile. And what's cool biogeographically is there's a lot of sort of northern and western African birds that get into western Ethiopia, and some of them actually come right up these valleys, all the way up to the Jemu Valley. So on this day of the tour, it's our only shot to see quite a few birds. Now, they're not endemics, but there's quite a few cool things. This is what it looks like in the Jemu Valley. So the first target actually is an endemic, which is the uh, Harwoods Franklin. The local people here have realized that birders want to see this and will give them a nice tip if they find the bird for them. So as soon as we arrive, there's kids sprinting everywhere and running, and they're shouting things in Amharic that I'm trying to understand, and I'm trying to communicate with them. And eventually, through all this chaos, we get to see this beautiful Franklin, maybe perched on some rock looking down a hill. After all the excitement, we have a field breakfast, have some wonderful Ethiopian coffee, maybe some scrambled eggs and some fresh bread. This is a feature of this tour. We eat about half of our meals in the field. It means you can keep birding while you have a meal. You eat often better food. And it's really one of my favorite parts about this tour. Here's another picnic lunch, just to show you. Here's a coffee stop up in the highlands. So it's really nice to be flexible and have a lot of field meals. After the Franklin and breakfast, we drop down into the valley, and this is one of those birds that comes in from Western Africa, the speckle-fronted weaver. It's our only chance on the tour. Quite a good-looking little bird. And there's other nice stuff like Abyssinian roller. We climb out of the Jemu Valley, and then we approach this area, which is a huge escarpment. This is the edge of the Ethiopian highlands and the edge of the Great Rift Valley. You can see this big fan is where the Rift Valley opens up. And this is the Afar Depression, goes out to Djibouti. So after spending the night in a local town, we drive out to this place called Gamesa Gadel. You're at almost 11,000 feet here on the edge of the escarpment. 
and you're looking through this notch. It is a spectacular place. You can see down, down, all the way into the sort of the desert in the Alfar Depression. You're sitting there at 11,000 feet. Spectacular place. A common theme on the Ethiopia tour is that you go to really amazing places to see pretty drab little birds. So in this case, the drab little bird is the Ankaber Seren, very localized endemic. But there's actually far cooler things to be seen at Gamesa Gadel. This is one of them. This is Gelada or Gelada Baboon. You can see these guys live right on the edge of these cliffs. There's a closer look at a couple of females. These monkeys have the second largest vocabulary of any animal after human. Very, very smart. This is a big male. They look very intimidating, but they're very peaceful. Uh, vegetarian monkeys, they basically spend their days sitting around aloe preening and eating grass. So we drive down the escarpment to our next lodge, which is actually built on a hill at the site of a former palace of an emperor of Ethiopia called Menelik. So this hill was actually the capital of Ethiopia for a while. Scenically spectacular place. After a siesta, maybe a coffee ceremony, they have a little coffee ceremony place. We drive down the escarpment, you see this winding road, and we go down into the lower elevations where it's hot and dry. And what are we doing? We're looking for this beauty, the yellow-throated seren. Don't worry, there's actually much cooler birds to be seen as well, like a yellow-breasted barbet. This is a bird of the Sahel of North Africa that just gets into this part of Ethiopia. And sometimes we get the half-colored kingfisher on the river. After sleeping up in the mountains, we drive down the escarpment again and we cross the Afar Plains. And we end up here in the Great Rift Valley at Awash National Park, which is one of Ethiopia's best birding spots. It's dry savanna and grassland. And it's the best place in the world to see bustards. There's nowhere that has more species than Awash National Park. This is a quarry bustard, and they often have these uh, northern carmine beaters on their back. This is one of the real prizes for birders, an Arabian bustard. Another bustard, Hartlips bustard, also pretty scarce. And here's a little video to show you a northern white-bellied bustard in action. Awash is quite a good place for mammals as well. This is a Summerings gazelle. And you also see Baisa oryx, big beautiful antelope. Really good place for sand grouse. This is a male chestnut-bellied sand grouse. And this is the intricately patterned Liechtenstein sand grouse. There's actually a big river running through the national park, the Awash River, and there's a big falls, and there's some more lusher woodland along the river, which has some different birds, such as the Nile Valley sunbird and rosy patched bushrike. The brush country also has some mammals, like the lesser kudu. Really beautiful, elegant animal. A lot of folks have seen the greater kudu, which is all across Africa, but the lesser kudu is only in the Horn of Africa. We always do a night drive at Awash, which is the best place in the world to see star-spotted nightjar. Let's look at the intricate patterning on this nightjar. It's a real beauty. Well, to continue the theme of going to spectacular places to see drab birds, we go to the base of Mount Fentale. This is a big volcano that last exploded about 200 years ago, leaving this big lava field at its base. And this lava field is one of the only places in the world that has somber rock chat. 
Leaving Awash, we head up into a more lush and slightly higher elevation part of the Rift Valley, the Central Rift Valley. This is an absolute paradise for birding. Wetlands, woodlands, forest, grassland, it has tons of habitats and unbelievable numbers of birds. I've always said if I was going to take someone who'd never birded one place in the world to try to convert them to a birder, it would be the Central Rift Valley of Ethiopia. Just a pleasure to bird. Huge numbers of marabou storks. These are like the trash collectors of the rift. We sleep here at Lake Langano. You see you have a couple lakes here that are very different. A Langano is shallow and muddy and fresh. And across the highway you have Lake Aviata, which is a salt lake. So we'll, I'll take you birding there in a minute. But here's what you can see at Lake Langano. Often our breakfast gets raided by birds. You've got Rupel's weavers and uh, superb starlings coming in trying to steal our food. It's a good problem to have when you're a birder. Birding in the woodlands, you might get black-billed wood hoopoo. This one's just caught a lizard. Or the beautiful African quail finch. It always looks to me like it belongs more in Australia than Africa. The central rift is just loaded with Palearctic migrant birds, like this masked shrike. There's even some lush fig forest, where you can see some spectacular black and white animals, like the silvery-cheeked hornbill, and the Guereza colobus, awesome monkey. It sounds like a Harley Davidson, actually. It looks pretty, but it doesn't sound too pretty. Crossing the highway, we do some birding over at Lake Abiata, the saline lake, loaded with birds, a whole different set of birds. You can see thousands of terns and gulls, tens of thousands of northern shoveler, 100,000 rough. I've seen millions of migrating barn swallows, just an unbelievably birdy place. And you can also see tens of thousands or sometimes even hundreds of thousands of flamingos, which is just one of the world's best natural spectacles. It's an incredible sight to see. Leaving behind the Rift Valley, we drive up into the Bali Mountains. This is in the southern highlands of Ethiopia. The lower elevation parts of the Bali Mountains look like this. This is dry juniper and hygienia forest, grassland, wetland. We make a stop at a place called Dinsho, which is a juniper forest where Abyssinian catbird is pretty common, and where local guides usually have staked out the Abyssinian or African long-eared owl. It's a very rare, beautiful owl. We sleep in this scruffy highland town of Goba, and then the next morning we drive up onto the Saneti Plateau. That's at about 13,000 feet. It's reputed to be Africa's highest all-weather road. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but sounds quite impressive. That's what it looks like up on the Sinedi Plateau. It's a sort of a moonscape. These big stalks are giant lobelias. Now most lobelias in the world are little flowers, but this thing grows to be 15 feet tall. And this is the number one target, not just on this day, but on the whole tour for a lot of people. This is the Ethiopian wolf. So unlike a typical wolf, which hunts big prey, this guy hunts rodents, and it just goes for volume of rodents. Can eat dozens in a day. Beautiful animal. Of course, there's some great birds up there as well. This is the Moreland Franklin, and the endemic spot-breasted lapwing. This is one of my favorite endemics. This is the Rouget's rail. Unlike most rails in the world, it's not shy. So 
sometimes see clip springers up there. Clip springer means cliff jumper in Afrikaans, and it's easy to see why in this picture. After exploring the Bali Mountains, we do a day trip 100 kilometers out into the middle of nowhere, into the dry country to this place called Sofomar. It's a sort of oasis, and it's a very geographically interesting place because you can see there's a river here, and the river just disappears into a cave, and then it emerges here on the other side. And in between, there's this vast and largely unexplored network of caves. You probably already guessed this, but what's our excuse for visiting this awesome place in the middle of nowhere? It's a little brown endemic bird. It's called Salvadori Seren. Here's some of the lush habitat along the river. And this place always amazes me because it has Narina trogans. Normally this is a forest dwelling bird, but there's just enough lush trees here for this bird to survive. Well, after doing uh, most of the morning birding, we can visit the caves where it's nice and cool. Quite a spectacular place. Well, we sleep another night in Goba, and then we drive to the south of Ethiopia, which is definitely my favorite part of this tour, and it's one of my favorite places in the world to bird. So we drive over the Sanedi Plateau again, and then we drop down into the Harena Forest, which is just this magical place. It's like some kind of fairyland forest. It's amazing that it's still there. One of the things we'll look for in Harena is crowned eagle. It's one of the world's biggest eagles. It mainly eats monkeys and smaller antelope. Check out these feet. It's a powerful eagle. After a long day's drive through some beautiful country, we end up in the scruffy little town of Negele. I often tell people that there's only two kinds of foreigners who go to Negele. There's people working with NGOs in the UN, and there's birders. It's way off the beaten track. Why do we go here? It's actually not a little brown bird. In this kind of habitat, you find what is arguably Ethiopia's coolest bird, Prince Ruspoli's Turaco. This Turaco was discovered by an Italian prince. After he discovered it, he was trampled to death by an elephant. So after he died, specimens were recovered in a specimen bag, but nobody knew where they'd come from. And so for almost a hundred years, the range of this bird was a mystery. Uh, it's one of these birds that just has a special mystique. If you look at the map again, you see east of Negele, there's a plain, and there's actually, it's called the Lieben Plain. There's actually a bird that is virtually endemic just to this plain. It's called the Sidamo lark, or the Lieben lark. Uh, it's a member of the genus Heteromorapha. There's only two in Africa, and both are incredibly rare. So I was visiting the Lieben plains once looking for the lark, and I noticed these kids walking from like almost a mile away. The big ones looking after the little ones, and they stayed in a row like this, and they walked all the way up to us. It was like some kind of deputation. It was an amazing experience. It's a pretty typical thing in Ethiopia that you have these wonderful encounters with kids and local people. And it's definitely a, a big part of a tour, a big part of what people enjoy. Here's sunset on the Lieben Plain. After we've seen the Lark, we head east, further into the middle of nowhere. It gets drier and drier. And this is what the habitat looks like. And if you don't know much about this area, you might think that it's going to be pretty dead, not a lot of birds. But this is actually one of my favorite habitats in the world, the bird. It is just loaded with birds. You got this little chickadee, a Somali tit, Abyssinian scimitar bill. A lot of these birds like to form these mixed flocks. You can get 20 species of birds in one mixed flock. This is one of my favorites, the red nape bushrike. Pretty rare one. 
and I think the world's best looking starling, golden breasted starling. What a bird. Driving from Nagele, we have a long drive through this back country. Beautiful, rugged, remote place. We just bird all along the way. We do make one specific stop at the Dawa River. And the reason why is that the Dawa flows into the Juba River. And if you look at this map, you'll see you've got this big stretch of dry country crossed by these rivers. And there's a couple birds that are only found along these rivers. Very, very localized birds. And one of them is the white-winged collared dove. Well, we eventually arrive in Yabello. It's a big, wide-open place, savanna and grassland. Here's a hoopoo on a termite mound. It gives you a little feel for what Yabello is like. Yabello's claim to fame for birders is that there are two highly localized endemic birds that are only found around this town. One of them is Stresemann's bush crow. It has this weird bright blue bare facial skin. And you often see the bush crows alongside the white crowned starling. The other localized endemic is the white tailed swallow. And to me the coolest thing about this bird is that it nests in termite mounds like this one. Uh, termite mounds are very prominent in this area around Yabello. There's actually quite a few big mammals too. This is a Garanook, which is one of my favorite African mammals. It's like a proto-giraffe. And they use that big long neck to crane up and get to things that other antelope can't reach. South of Yabello, the earth gets very, very red. And this is where you find foxy lark, which almost perfectly matches that red soil. Yabello is a great area for the huge Abyssinian ground hornbill, which uh, sort of exemplifies what's wonderful about Ethiopian birding. This bird has been eliminated from most of its range uh, by hunting persecution. It's common in Ethiopia. You see it next to villages and walking around in farm fields. In the evening, we stay out in the uh, dry savanna, watch the sunset. These are some white-bellied go-away birds. And then we do a night drive. It's one of my favorite night drives in the world. This is one of our targets, Donaldson Smith's night jar. Kind of specialized on these red soils. We might also see three-banded courser. From Yabello, we head north and we drop back into the Great Rift Valley and we spend the night at another rift lake, which is called Lake Awasa. There's a big town of Awasa next to the lake. And again, like the other portions of the central rift, this is just a birding paradise. People and birds coexisting, literally rubbing shoulders in some cases. This little video will give you a feel for what it's like at the fish market in Awasa. Fantastic for photographers. You just don't know where to point your lens. African pygmy goose is pretty common. A wonderful little bird. Again, this thing is shy across most of its range, but you can walk right up to them at Lake Owasa. Widespread pied kingfisher. So on the final day of the trip, we drive up from Lake Awasa through the central rift valley and then we climb up into the northern mountains again back to Addis Ababa. And we have a final dinner at this place called Habesha 2000. I'm not a big fan of, you know, cultural spectacles and dancing and stuff. It often seems kind of artificial, but I love this place. And one thing that's cool about it is that most of the people here are Ethiopians. So this is a legitimate cultural thing. The food is fantastic. Like everything else in Ethiopia, it's distinctive and different and defies your expectations. Whole variety of stews, meat dishes, great vegetables for vegetarians, and it's all served up on this 
sourdough pancake called injera. Love it. My mouth is watering. You settle in maybe with a cold beer and you watch some of these local dance troops performing and these guys are just amazing. Like everything in Ethiopia, it's just distinctive and different and funky and awesome. So I'll, I'll let you listen to a little bit of Ethiopian music to give you just a little bit of a feel for what it's like. <laughs> Well, that wraps up our virtual tour. Thanks for joining me. The next virtual tour I'll be doing is to Bhutan. That should be released in about 10 days. For folks who are interested in actually visiting Ethiopia, I'll tell you a little bit more about the tour. This is a tour that has a very, very bad reputation for having horrible accommodation. And I think a lot of the reason for this is a place called the Green Motel. Now, this used to be the best and virtually only accommodation in Nagele, and it was pretty grim. They basically didn't even have water with which to clean this place. It was so bad that some people who were on a tour with me actually made t-shirts afterward that said, I survived the Green Motel on them. But not to worry, the days of the Green Motel are over. There's a couple comfortable guest houses now in Nagele, and all throughout the tour, there's been big upgrades in accommodation. So you really don't have to stay in any basic places. I would say the accommodation is moderate throughout the tour. So if you need five-star luxury type places, don't come to Ethiopia, but if you're okay with typical bird tour accommodation, you'll be fine. Um, there's some long dusty drives, which are tough for some folks, although they're always scenically interesting. And you do spend that one day at 13,000 feet, so just make sure that you're okay at high altitudes. <laughs> Come <laughs> on.